So welcome all of you to the biodiversity seminar of today, which is my first one that I'm organizing. And today we have a great speaker, Monica Egerer from the Technical University of Munich. I prepared a short bio sketch together with Monica <laughs> to tell you a bit uh, about her. So Monica did her bachelor in biology in the Kalamazoo College in Michigan. And then she moved to California to study her master's and her PhD in the University of California in Santa Cruz in environmental studies, but with a strong focus, I guess, in urban ecology, urban gardens, and biodiversity. And after that, she got a bit tired of the US, so she moved to the other side of the ocean, to Germany, to do her postdoc at the Technical University in Berlin with Ingo Kovarik, also in urban ecology. And after that, I think like around two years ago, three years ago, more or less, she became assistant professor at the Technical University of Munich in the group of urban productive ecosystems. So yeah, please welcome Monica. <laughs> and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think I have two mics, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Cool, okay. Thank you um, very much for the kind introduction that we <laughs> came up with together this morning. Um, so yeah, my name is Monica Egger and I am a assistant professor uh, for Urban Productive Ecosystems or Urbana Productive Ecosysteme on the TU Munich um, based in Freising. So everyone is warmly welcome to Freising. If you go to GFU, I heard that we will be uh, hosting GFU in, yeah, next year, um, already in 2024. So the title of my talk today is Small But Powerful, The Ecological and Social Value of Urban Ecosystems. So for those of you yeah, that don't know who we are, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce myself and also uh, my uh, group mates. Uh, so we have been around since 2020 um, at the TU Munich. We consist of two postdocs, uh, one technical assistant, a secretary, four PhDs, seven master students, and four bachelor students. And I just like to give uh, yeah credit to these people because uh, they are um, the yeah the drivers of a lot of the projects and results uh, or concepts that I'll be presenting on today. And what motivates us to do the work that we do are some of these big global challenges that are facing our world. And this includes land use change due to urbanization or agricultural intensification, climate change and massive biodiversity loss. And maybe this is why uh, you are all motivated to do the work that, that you are doing. And among these global challenges, urban ecosystems are becoming increasingly important for a multitude of functions and what we call ecosystem services or these benefits that we derive from ecosystem properties and processes. So from tree-lined streetscapes to city parks, uh, to urban gardens, these are all examples of urban ecosystems and urban green infrastructure. And our research considers these systems to be very important hotspots for biodiversity of plants and animals, both above ground and below ground. And they're important for various ecological functions that they perform like pollination or pest predation, decomposition and soil building processes. Urban ecosystems are also important for urban climate regulation, filtering pollutants and increasing water storage like infiltration swales in the landscape shown here that maybe, yeah, we ride our bikes past and don't realize um, the, the, yeah, their functions and the value that they, that they have for um, our city landscapes. And from a social perspective, urban ecosystems are important places for social cohesion, education, and recreation. So one good success story may be campus gardens um, that at least we have at the TU Munich and that are springing up across universities uh, worldwide, or this permaculture-based garden piece of land in Berlin. They are also important for relaxation, restoration, and nature connection. Uh, so we go to parks to do sports, to read a book under a tree, um, or to play and explore uh, nature. And if we consider urban agricultural ecosystems, urban agricultural systems, then agroecosystems can be important for vegetable production, food security, and food sovereignty. 
And so given all of these important aspects of urban ecosystems, we are motivated to investigate what drives potential functions and benefits of urban ecosystems and how we may ultimately through evidence improve them. So our work, uh, uses research to understand ecological and social patterns and processes in urban ecosystems, to develop evidence-based practice-oriented recommendations to support biodiversity, ecosystem services, and human well-being in urban ecosystems, and to guide the role of people as ecosystem managers to promote biodiversity, ecosystem services, as well as human well-being. And so to answer these questions, we largely study how ecosystems are managed, how urban landscapes are managed, and how the social aspects of people associated uh, with ecosystems and landscapes affect different aspects of biodiversity, whether it's predators or pollinators or plants or soils, and um, ultimately different ecosystem functions and services, as well as dimensions of human well-being. So the laboratory in which we conduct our investigations include urban community gardens. So this is like our um, yeah, baby uh, from, or I guess one of the initial projects of our research group. Um, so gardens like Espar Stadt in Munich, uh, where these are community or yeah, collectively uh, managed um, by a group of individuals uh, or households. And people may have individual plots or there's community plots that people collectively uh, manage. Also urban parks like here in Munich and recently sustainable urban drainage systems or SUDs as they are called um, like, like this SUD in actually in Portland, not where we work, but a very nice example um, that I saw last year. The methods that we use include traditional field methods in urban ecology combined with experiments in the laboratory and greenhouse, as well as utilizing citizen science and participatory methods. Like this person, this gardener measuring a plant here on the, on the right. And while many of the systems in which we work are rather small, perhaps just 400 square meters in size, we work under the hypothesis that despite being small, these systems can have a powerful impact when scaled up across the landscape for supporting biodiversity or for supporting ecosystem functions and ultimately services. So exam for example, gardens may be stepping stones across a city for bees, while small parks around the corner can be value, valuable meeting points for people. And so today I want to present research in two systems in which we work. So this urban community garden project, as well as urban parks, and present how we are conducting ecological and social research in these systems to understand um, the value of, of these systems. So for our urban garden projects, we are working under three main research questions. And so first is what is the biodiversity and plants in urban gardens? Which features of local garden level and landscape level uh, promote plant and animal biodiversity and associate ecosystem services? And can factors that correlate with plant and animal biodiversity and ecosystem services be implemented to promote uh, biodiversity and services in these gardens in subsequent years. And so I'll mostly present on the first two aspects because, or the first two questions, um, because question three is going to be started or is like the next phase of our project, which we're starting collect or with um, gardeners collectively um, this year, where we'll be implementing, um, yeah, a lot of different insect friendly moss nomen or interventions in these gardens. So to invest these questions, we're working in 30 community gardens in Munich and Berlin, Germany, and they are ideally <laughs> distributed across the landscape so that we have a nice gradient in urbanization. Uh, but it is a little bit tricky because you can't necessarily uh, select where community gardens may be in, in a city. So we do the best that we can. Um, but also important is that we have a gradient in how or a variation in how these gardens are managed. Um, so here are just two gardens, again, Espar Stadt and Stadtacker, and they have different designs, different um, motivations of gardeners, different plants that they're growing, um, et cetera. And so we're interested in studying these and, or studying these management factors. And here are also two gardens that we work in in Berlin. 
And again, we see that these gardens have different uh, land uses that are surrounding them. So whether or not there is a lot of green space or a lot of imperviousness um, surrounding the sites. And we think, or we, um, yeah, measure the different land uses surrounding the sites uh, so that we can see how landscape context may influence our response variables of interest. So again, uh, one of these gardens is in a very dense uh, urban area in Munich uh, near the Ostbahnhof for the East um, train station. And the other one is in Olympia Park and there's a lot of blue and gray or green space surrounding this garden. Within these gardens, we establish a 20 by 20 meter uh, sampling plot in which to concentrate our measures. Uh, so this is an invisible or a drawn uh, uh, example of, of our sample plot in Sonnengarten in Soln in Munich. And we basically um, set uh, one by one meter sampling plots uh, within, these, uh, within these gardens in which we uh, look at these different management factors of the gardens. Um, so for example, um, the plant diversity in cover, the ground cover management, um, and, the, and what species are growing in these plants and whether they're flowering. So here are just some examples of these variables that we're looking at. Uh, so what is the ground cover composition? Is there a lot of bare soil? Is there a lot of mulch? Is there grass? Uh, what is the abundance and richness of trees and shrubs? And are they flowering? What is the abundance and richness of plants and the abundance and richness of flowers? And because we are particularly interested in pollinators in most of our urban garden research, we also look at what are nesting resources. And these nesting resources include sand structures, stone structures, dead wood structures, and insect hotels. We also have weather stations in the gardens that we can record uh, real-time data and also gardeners can use um, because they use this new fancy technology. I don't know how new it is, uh, Laura Vaughn. <laughs> so um, yeah, we have these stations up there that gardeners can also access what is the air air temperature, what is the humidity levels in my garden um, and what is the pollution uh, in, in the gardens. And so again, because we are very interested in pollinators in our current projects and their importance for pollination, we walk these uh, invisible uh, transects that I showed before uh, to record the pollinators that are visiting flowers. And we also conduct specific plant pollinator observations like Julia is doing on these strawberry plants. And uh, we also, I don't have a photo here, but use pan trap sampling. And so we do this every month. And we also in measure indicators of pollination performance. So we use experimental plants like strawberries and chilies. And so here's one of our students, Heen, who did this for his master's project. And so he left out these, um, these strawberry plants in the gardens and some of them had little bags over the flowers and some of them were open to pollinators. And here we're working under the hypothesis that those flowers that are open to pollinators will largely have a, a juicy, beautiful strawberry fruit, while those that are closed to pollinators may have um, malfunction or malfunctions or mis misshapen fruits, um, or may not be um, as big or as seedy as these that are visited by insect pollinators. We also have a wasp queen, uh, Julia, who is very fascinated by the important yet understudied role that wasps may play for pest control in these gardens. And so she has been collecting wasp nests to evaluate the fitness and the diet composition of wasps. And so here we see in work that she did in New Zealand uh, that social wasps are consuming many agricultural pests in, in, in New Zealand, um, natural ecosystems. And so we'd be interested to consider whether social wasps could be effective predators also in urban agriculture. And these are pretty abundant in cities and we may call them urban winners. Um, and yeah, even if they are a bit scary and unsexy, uh, they are important aspects of the biodiversity in, in these gardens and in our cities. And so simultaneously to some of these ecological investigations, we're also doing um, social investigations. And so uh, we want to study people's perceptions, their management practices, and their values. 
because their management decisions uh, that we can quantitatively assess may also explain or, re or relate to our response variables of focus. So here is a WASP survey that Julia did last year to understand how um, WASPs uh, are associated with people's fears or whether people want uh, WASPs in their gardens or not. And then we also um, have people telling us how much water they use in their gardens or how much uh, soil amendments they use in their gardens. And finally, we also use citizen science approaches to involve people in our investigations. So for example, this past summer, uh, we had um, a master's student uh, conduct a teabag experiment. I think Marco is familiar with this as well, uh, where we looked at how soil management and irrigation are related to decomposition of these tea bags. And there's this global um, tea bag index uh, where we, if we use a standardized um, yeah, protocol, we can relate decomposition in, in these gardens with this global database. Okay, I'll take a sip of water. So over the past year, we have documented over 700 taxa across the two cities. And we find that gardens may, yeah, host and expand the natural habitats of some endangered species, either through intentional planting or accidental introduction, or because these gardens are um, neighboring um, some, some, yeah, nice, uh, or I, I don't know, yeah, nicer or more in state uh, ecosystems like forest fragments or, or uh, prairies. Uh, we also find lost plants like false cleavers, which was actually classified as extinct in Berlin and may have been introduced in a garden through substrate or planting material. We find forgotten plants like old crops and medicinal herbs like motherwort. And we find um, novel crops in at least the German context uh, like shizo um, or soybean. And this is reflect, maybe reflecting the multicultural background of, of gardeners or experimental nature of gardeners. And so we found that the number of cultivated plant species correlates with wild plant species. And this suggests that these urban ecosystems can be synergistic in providing food for both people um, and animals and also um, support uh, yeah, biodiversity conservation of, of plants. In Ber Berlin alone, we have documented over 100 wild bee species, and this is about 40% of all bee species recorded in Berlin. And 20, 25 of these species were on the red list of Berlin. And we have found that plant species richness, or just the number of plants that we document in these gardens, is a strong positive predictor of wild bee species richness and abundance. So here, as the number of plant species increases, the number of wild bee species and the number of wild bees increases. And if we look at specific indices of biodiversity, such as the Shannon's index and functional dispersion, uh, we also see that they have a positive impact on the functional diversity of bees. So as the taxonomic diversity of vegetation increases, the functional diversity of wild bees also increases. We also find that with higher flower richness, uh, we have more complex interactions between plants and pollinators. So here are network interaction webs for pollinators and plants um, at where plants are on the bottom blocks and pollinators are on these top blocks. And so we uh, show this for, yeah, as for gardens with the highest, um, yeah, the highest richness of flowering plants uh, and those with the lower, lower, um, yeah, flowering plant uh, richness. And so we just see, yeah, that these webs are more complex to say it simply. And it seems that more wildness in these gardens in turn encourages more bees. So the more deadwood structures present, the greater the number of bee species and bee individuals. However, the landscape context and specifically urbanization influences the effect of plant diversity. So wild bees are especially uh, positively supported by woody vegetation in gardens. So as the number of woody plants increases, the number of wild bee species increases, uh, but especially so in these gardens that are in uh, more urban neighborhoods. So basically the effect of, of woody plants uh, has a high impact. Oh yeah. I don't know, can I use this? Yeah, 
<laughs> seems a little bit disorienting to me at least. So maybe I won't do that. Um, but in these gardens that have yeah high imperviousness, there's, uh, as we add the number of woody plant species with this red line, we have, um, yeah, more, more bee species in comparison to where we have low imperviousness in the landscape. So there's more natural cover in the landscape, maybe more parks or um, or just more green space. The effect of woody plants is stable, like this orange line we see. So adding woody plants may not necessarily be as important in these gardens if there's a lot of trees and shrubs already surrounding the gardens in the landscape. Okay. And for pollination of plants in these gardens, we perhaps find not so, not so surprisingly that the factors that predict seed mass or fruit mass largely vary by plant species. Uh, so here is just uh, showing um, the directionality of how different factors impact uh, to uh, wild plants and to um, crop plants in the gardens. And what we see is that both urban context and bee diversity are together influencing pollination, um, but potentially in different directions. And that the, yeah, so, so for example, yeah, strawberry fruit mass increases with higher pollinator diversity, but decreases in gardens with more impervious cover. And what's interesting too, is that the urban environment may offer new opportunities to, to farm or garden. Uh, so we see that um, higher temperature, which may be indicative of urban heat island effects where the city is hotter than the surroundings, uh, may have a positive impact on chili um, seed development and fruit development. And so what this work is telling us so far, and I'm just presenting on a part of our results, is that the management of gardens can predict plant and animal diversity, plant animal interactions and likely ecosystem service provision. And humans are important designers of these ecosystems and their plant and animal inhabitants and the ecological value to urban biodiversity. Oopa. And so it's great that gardens are valuable for biodiversity. I think for ecologists, this is, yeah, they, this is, this is a good thing for, for that we are interested in. Um, but what about for people, especially because these are people-centered ecosystems and people are the designers of these ecosystems. And so I just want to briefly touch on the study where we looked at the benefits of gardens um, or the role of gardens for people during the pandemic, uh, where we asked what do people value the most about gardening during the pandemic and what experiences did people have during this time? And so here we did um, a international survey with a group of international researchers. And this is back when I was still in Berlin. And so just looking at the distribution of survey respondents in German alone, uh, we had about a thousand participants in Germany and worldwide almost 4,000 participants. And what we found is that gardening are, yeah, gardens are yeah, valued for connecting people to nature, for stress release, and for spending time outdoors, as well as for food. So most people said that these factors were very important or important um, in response to the question, how important are the following reasons to you for having a garden? And in our open-ended questions, we find more qualitative answers about the role of and the value of gardens. Um, so for example, um, that, yeah, the garden is one thing or the gardening is one thing, but the contemplation of doing the other, it all happens much more mindfully and intensively. Even the birds are felt louder or gardens are important for health and well-being, especially for poor people as well as gardens are a necessary element of food system decentralization, or that just having fresh fruits and vegetables is important for families at this time. So we can see that gardens can be valuable places also for people who in turn create ecologically valuable habitat for biodiversity. So I really like this example of, of this uh, little like half meter pond um, that a gardener has installed in her plot in Berlin. And I think that 
yeah, this gets at this idea that even if interventions are small, um, they can still likely have an impact, uh, maybe just at the habitat scale. Um, but if we add up these interventions across gardens, across the landscape, potentially we could have an impact on biodiversity of our cities. So now I want to turn to a second study system of ours, urban gardens and green spaces, and discuss our project Stadtbewasen, where we are studying the ecological and social value of what we are calling these Stadtbewasen or green oases in the city of Munich. So here, the main research questions that are motivating this work are what are health benefits of green spaces? How does green space size, vegetation composition, and structure affect meteorological factors in green spaces? How does green space size, vegetation composition and structure and meteorological factors, uh, mouthful, affect the health benefits of green spaces? And what do urban residents want from their urban oases and how should oases be developed? So here we are working um, in parks uh, across the city and those that are small, mid-size and large parks. And we set up reference sites as well in gray areas neighboring these, these sites. And we're interested in um, this small but powerful hypothesis. And this is why we've selected sites that vary in size. And uh, what we do is we are um, doing both ecological um, measurements and also social, social science surveys. So we set up 50 by 50 meter plots in these sites. And here's just an example of, of um, one park. And these plots are selected so that they vary in their vegetation um, structure and complexity. So here uh, is just yeah showing that some of these plots have low vegetation or no vegetation, and there's a lot of cement or sand. Um, and some of these plots have yeah high um, vegetation. And so we're trying to get a gradient in the complexity of these, of these plots um, that then represent uh, the, the parks. And at the bird's eye view, I guess you could say, uh, Sophie, who is a PhD candidate on this project, she is walking around with this terrestrial laser scanner and trying to create 3D point clouds of these plots um, that then we uh, can look at how this relates to the meteorological factors of these sites. And so here again is Sophie um, setting up temperature loggers in, in our plots um, across Munich and hanging them to light, po light posts or trees uh, because we weren't allowed to put in anchors into these parks. Uh, and then again here, um, showing how we have these reference points that are gray. And so we can um, look at how the temperature is different from or in these green spaces to the gray spaces. And so here are just some preliminary results from our work now, and this is just started. Uh, so we're just reading out in December um, past months of data. And so here's uh, what we're seeing is that local temperatures within the green spaces really vary. And so here's just some data from December. A lot of people are like, why are you guys looking at winter data? But this is actually something that's kind of underexplored, uh, I would say in urban ecology is to understand uh, the winter dynamics of parks or, or of gardens. Um, so people are still using parks in the winter, walking their dogs or whatever, or playing sports or reading books when it's not that cold out. Uh, so we're trying to understand social benefits of parks in winter and also what are some of these cooling or warming factors of, of the parks and how is that related to vegetation structure. And so, yeah, um, we see, I think also interesting is that the mean nighttime air temperature and daytime temperature tends to be uh, warmer in the inner city. So this is again, indic indicative of urban heat island effects. Uh, so in comparison, in comparing our gray and green spaces, uh, and this is, yeah, I think um, something that we will then analyze in, rela in relation to our vegetation within these plots. Um, and so, yeah, here I'm um, looking at the differences as well where we see that there's low difference in temperature in some of these plots in the center of the city, um, probably because at night, um, they're still not necessarily cooling off, where those that are more south in Munich are probably getting more um, luft or fresh air from the mountains, or more likely to cool off if they're connect well connected to other green spaces. 
And so here, what we're going to do is look at how this then also relates and at the park level to the park um, or these plot structural characteristics. And we are also interested in the social science investigations. And so here we're interested in the social functions and experiences of park visitors. Um, and so we're doing observations, we're doing field interviews, uh, focus groups, as well as collecting um, information from like the Google reviews or doing our own um, crowdsourcing campaigns that I'll talk about. We're doing survey questionnaires and field interviews to understand health and well-being benefits and also doing yeah, crowdsourcing and citizen science to get people involved. So here's just work um, that we're starting to look at green space use and social functions is what are behaviors that are observed for different visitors at different times. And so within our um, 50 by 50 meter plots, we'll basically be uh, marking different act activities that we observe people doing, um, as well as doing that or followed up with um, short intercept surveys with park visitors. And to measure health and well-being indicators associated with green spaces, uh, we are did a preliminary um, or I guess pilot study of a survey questionnaire on the role of the park environment, uh, use and nature connection and perceived naturalness on psychological benefits and, and restoration. And we did this in three parks in Munich, two that are, or one that is large, one that is relatively small, and compared this also to a more green um, uh, space in, in uh, pausing Munich. And we had um, survey questionnaires hung up and we also did uh, surveys with people. So you hear, see Vera uh, sitting, uh, interviewing an older woman um, next to this uh, Kugelbaum or Kugelbaum <laughs> uh, that is, that is um, yeah, estab or established on this plot. And so what uh, Vera has already found, who's the master student on this project is that well-being indicators differ between these urban gray and green spaces. Um, so particularly when comparing our, yeah, when, when we compare Pausinger Stop Park with the marine plots, uh, we see that those that, yeah, those that were interviewed in the, in the, in the Pausinger um, Park were more likely to, to have more higher moods or more positive mood indicators, uh, be more yeah, satisfied with their li lives and had higher restoration capacity in comparison uh, to this more um, gray green space. And what we found is that the perceived naturalness of the sites had people rate uh, naturalness. Uh, this also positively associated with restoration capacity. And so I think what this suggests is that container trees uh, like that we are increasingly seeing being put up across our cities to add green space um, is, yeah, I, I see this as like the fast food of urban greening and this quick green or fast food of green is not necessarily perceived the same um, by people and probably may have other um, impacts on people's restoration um, or on their well-being benefits that they may get from these places. And so for per citizen participation, we also have a website and a survey to find locations of where people's oases are in the city uh, so that people can identify and tell us and describe uh, where they are, yeah, seeking oases in, in Munich. And so just some examples of responses and their context, we see that some of these oases are just small little flicks in, in the landscape, um, but nonetheless are making people feel free, happy and cared for by natural elements. And so here are just um, two examples that I drew from our data set. Um, yeah, one of these is like a small little uh, wooded space in between two agricultural fields uh, in pausing. And the other is uh, plots um, in the middle of the city um, that, yeah, this person said that they feel like the trees in the large church make them feel well cared for. Cared for. And so this is all ongoing work and hopefully the next time um, that I talk uh, to you all or in maybe we cross paths somewhere else at a conference, um, I'll be able to present more information on the relationships among ecological, meteorological and social factors in these oases. And because we're not just doing research, uh, I don't know if, yeah, maybe some of you are also involved in teaching projects, um, but this is also a lot of what we do is doing teaching activities at the TOM. And I just wanna talk about um, some of these teaching activities that have 
uh, catapulted into also research um, projects of ours. And so we have um, two projects right now on tiny forests and also in um, garden education that we are doing. And um, yeah, I will talk briefly about these two uh, projects. The first is it is Tiny Forest um, Project. And uh, this is a trend, I would say, in urban greening uh, that uses this restoration concept, uh, the Miyawaki method for small green spaces, where, yeah, the, uh, many cities are saying that this is a way to create uh, long standing vegetation or new forests in, in high dense environments. And so what we had students do is design a tiny forest with the wishes and needs of city residents. And we did this in um, Halberg Moos, which is just south of the Munich airport. And this was, yeah, also to get to students to learn about, um, about project planning and, and uh, how also in forest urban forest ecology. And so, yeah, we identified sites where, people, where the students could do this. We had them take soil samples to understand soil conditions. And they also looked at how green spaces within the city vary in comparison to um, gray spaces in the city. We also had them do survey questionnaires and focus groups and world cafes with city residents. And then we had them design forest concepts and present these to stakeholders. And so here are just some um, ideas that the students had, whether it was a Klosterwald, a Naschwald that incorporated uh, fruit trees and, and um, edible aspects of the, of the tiny forest and a Winzelwald. So this is very much based on the tiny forest concept where we're um, having maybe native plants um, and nature experience is very important. And this was a cool project. Uh, it got a lot of press uh, and also, and also st I think, sparked some um, yeah, spin-off projects by, by neighboring uh, communities. And so I just, yeah, I like to share this story because it's kind of cool how these kind of teaching activities can then, yeah, spur um, yeah, other conversations in, in um, urban greening. I don't, yeah. And then I will talk a little bit about this other project, Camp Campus Academy. And this is where we're training students to um, yeah, be multiplicators in urban garden activities and teaching. And so this is where the students learn about soil composting, for example, to then teach soil composting um, to uh, elementary school students or uh, to high school students or at the university level. And this is a collaboration um, with this organization, Acker A. Fowl, uh, that is, yeah, t cre has created this like uh, educational platform um, for um, preschools and schools to teach uh, campus gardening education. And so I think that, yeah, here is where the students had to learn how to prepare a field. They had to understand soil conditions. Um, they learned about how about crop rotations, and in the end, we had a very productive learning garden um, that now we are following in our other uh, urban research or urban garden research project. So, um, I think I'll yeah start to wrap it up, looking at the time, and I want to return to the title of my talk um, that I've called "Small but Powerful." and reflect back on what we may learn from these ecosystems in our schools. Oops, is that me? Sorry. My, I don't know what's going So these can be sites where we find high amounts of biodiversity uh, that benefit from management interventions and thereby create possibility to support various ecosystem functions. These are also places where people find a connection to nature or feel care, cared for by nature, which may contribute to stress release and restoration, uh, particularly in times of hardship. And they are also places where we can teach and learn about urban ecology and urban agriculture and ecological research methods. And I think why this work is important and um, yeah, I am glad that there's growing interest in urban ecology or in e urban ecosystems, 
because we still lack a fundamental understanding of how urban land use affects biodiversity or how potential conservation interventions uh, may impact biodiversity. And so for some of our projects, we are just doing now like scans on what's there and what are correlations that explain patterns of biodiversity. Uh, but what's also important is to make um, these habitat interventions to see what happens when we do change um, urban land use. And so there are, you know, projects from these tiny forests like we see on the right, um, but also these like pop-up uh, pop up greening strategies um, like this outside of the State Library of Victoria in Australia, where these um, grassland pop-ups uh, actually were, were had positive boosts on spider um, activity uh, and diversity over six weeks. And so maybe even these small interventions um, can promote biodiversity in the city. And we also still lack research practice interfaces and participatory approaches in research that can better account for resident values and thereby support more sustainable and equitable urban planning processes. And so there are some cool projects um, that I like to talk about. Um, I'm not involved in them. I was, well, I was a mapper when I was living in Berlin where I was one of the people putting um, things on the map. Um, but there's nice projects that are trying to get people to put down on the map where do you see biodiversity? Where do you see um, where we should create habitat for biodiversity in the city? And this can be effective in getting people to realize that the city is a shared landscape with people and with animals and plants. And if we don't put these things on the map and if we don't get people involved uh, and to realize that biodiversity is important, um, then we will consistently lose valuable green space um, that is important for, for us and for biodiversity. And so perhaps um, information uh, can, about the ecological and the social value of these spaces uh, can, yeah, give a voice to the, their importance and why um, they should still exist. And so unfortunately, we often have yeah, lost um, many gardens that we work in over the years. And uh, every time it just, it like, it'll break my heart um, knowing what was once there. Um, so this is just an example from last year. We lost one of our gardens in Munich uh, that was uh, recently, yeah, bulldozed. And so I hope uh, that uh, work like ours and what we're trying to do in Munich or in Berlin, uh, maybe eventually in Zurich through some nice collaborations uh, could provide a justification for the value of these systems. Um, so what we know more about and understand and in turn communicate to the public is a validation for the maintenance and promotion of urban ecosystems. So in closing, I will thank all these people uh, that do a lot of work and ride around the city. Also our bus, Gerti, who has put a lot of miles uh, this year in, in Munich visiting um, all of our sites. And um, thank you, yeah, to, to you all for listening uh, to the presentation today. And I'm happy to take uh, questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Monica, for this super interesting talk. Uh, I think we have plenty of time for questions. So, any volunteer? I have one just, is it on? Yeah, I guess. Just curiosity in the one of the first graph you show on the diet of wasps. Mm -hmm. There were some birds, card reform. And I was just wondering if it was like fecal materials or stuff like this that they use to build the nest or if it's if they really like feed on dead birds or stuff like this. Do, do, do. It was already at the beginning, I think. I have too many slides. Before sorry. The, yeah, here. Yeah. I was wondering oh it gets here if it's like uh, sequencing errors or like if it's in the nest and or they're an eating idea. dead meat. Oh, dead meat, yeah, it could be dead yeah. meat. Yeah. Oh. So, um, I mean, wasps are, yeah, we eat, see them eating like lunch meat. So I, I don't know if it's an error, but um, yeah, and I wish that Julia was here. If I had like a phone, a friend, Julia is, yeah. Um, but eating like dead, dead duck meat. 
So, I mean, wasps are generalist predators, carnivorous. They, yeah. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if they were feeding on a dead animal. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, for this very broad uh, overview. I mean, there's plenty of, <laughs> of um, yeah, possible questions. Maybe I just start with um, with the one uh, that linked the the very end of your presentation with the urban densification and disappearing of, and the, this graph where you showed that uh, planting plants in a in a very dense area uh, provide more. Uh, I think was pollinators, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, and uh, my, my question is like related to sink source effect. I mean, are these small islands, uh, which are providing a, a lot of pollinators, sink? Shall we still uh, like, a, is it like a trap mm -hmm. or um, are they well connected? Uh, and uh, so maybe if you can, if you can uh, maybe say something about uh, also your, your position, um, in respect to, to densification, no? mm -hmm. I mean, we dens also in Switzerland, we densify it a lot because of uh, to the, the sprawling outside. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, I mean, your results shows that um, it's, it's not the, the best for, for cities. So this land sparing, land sharing, can, can you maybe? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I mean, I can't say per se with our data what, what whether the gardens are ecological traps or not. I think that it's a very important question. Yes. Um, or how like connectedness, this is not an analysis that we haven't done, like how garden connectedness may relate or predict um, diversity of bees, for example. We had, did not find in this analysis that garden size was important, a port, an important predictor. In other research, it shows that like garden size or proximity to semi-natural areas in the city is important for bee diversity within a garden. Um, so it may depend on the city. It may depend on the distribution of green spaces. And we don't, we can't really say uh, whether or not the bees that we find in a pan trap or that we observe uh, are, yeah, just passing by and using that garden briefly um, or whether they, yeah, are very, localized and only really using that habitat. So yeah, I think that we need future research that looks at these like source sink dynamics. Um, I wouldn't say, I think we need, yeah, I would, yeah, I would say we still need these larger green spaces in our cities for sure um, as important like sources for biodiversity. Um, and that's why, yeah, I mean, yeah, I hope that the big green spaces don't get bulldozed over. I think that like places like English or Garten in Munich, for example, or some of these big sp spaces, we, there's yeah, maybe a threat for that they would get smaller, like Tempelhoferfeld in Berlin, um, but that was vetoed, which is, which is um, or that process was then vetoed by um, the city and its residents. Um, yeah, so I don't really have an answer for you, but I would say whether or not they're ecological traps or not, we don't know. I wouldn't say that people shouldn't focus on or people shouldn't make the time investment or the planting investment in these gardens because um, they're, yeah, sinks and not valuable habitat. I still think that even these small interventions can provide habitat in the city. Uh, something that we were talking about, we don't really know how the use of balconies um, and like these small little um, aspects of vegetation, I think are important for, for insect pollinators. Um, yeah, so I think that that's like, counter, in, in, from my perspective, I think that that's maybe counterproductive from like a social, social ecological perspective to say, that our these yeah that we will create ecological traps if we plant better gardens for biodiversity, <laughs> um, but uh, I do think that we still need these large spaces as important sources um, for biodiversity, especially of arthropods or flying insects. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, Marco. I don't have a smart answer, but yeah. <laughs>
thanks a lot. It was really interesting. There's a lot of things to unpack for sure. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask is about, like you showed how more plants, how more roots, all of that was really beneficial for biodiversity in your gardens. Um, but what exactly do you mean by cultivated plants? What kind of roots? Like, should we plant native, non-native? Should we try to, when, not, when we all have to plant non-native, how do we select those ones? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, yeah, if you had any insight on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, what I presented today is kind of like the, yeah, just like numbers. Oh, yeah, th counting deadwood. Um, what we then did this past year is looked at what more characteristics of the deadwood itself, uh, whether it's lying down, whether it's standing up, uh, whether it's in the sun, whether it's in the shade. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to provide more detail on like the mechanisms potentially um, behind why there is this correlation. Um, and I think also with the deadwood case, it's, yeah, it's, I, I talked about that as like, maybe it's an indicator for messiness or like niches in the garden landscape that um, pollinators could use uh, those that nest in these resources. Uh, so we don't, I can't really say much about the mechanisms behind deadwood, but hopefully in the future, I could say more uh, because we looked at these aspects. Um, but yeah, whether or not, yeah, where or the condition of that deadwood itself and what pollinators it's supporting uh, is an open question, at least for us. And which plants to select? So those that are cultivated, we identified as um, like vegetable crops or um, ornamentals or like ornamental flowers or herbs, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, gar or bees are still using, uh, yeah, these crops that are flowering that maybe we don't necessarily, like brassica, I think is a good example that maybe we don't necessarily um, want our brassica brassicas to go to seed and, uh, or flower and go to seed and um, become weeds uh, if they're not um, desired in uh, our neighbor's garden beds, for example, um, but they're still used. So, so we divide up uh, or we characterize um, the different, or the, yeah, I guess I should say we, yeah, we have traits for each of these plants that we use. And so, yeah, that's, I guess, to define what we mean by cultivated and for recommendations uh, for plants. Um, yeah, non-native, native. native I think this is a very good and open question depending on like the climate conditions of cities now and in the future. And um, I, yeah, we see that gardeners are experimenting themselves with what may be good um, native plants, but also non-native plants that can survive in the heat. Uh, so some of these sites in which we work I mean, their gardens on like asphalt and like in the summer, it's like 45 degrees some days on or yeah on the on the asphalt and it creates this like little heat island in and of itself and we see uh that yeah many plants um, that are not like diligently watered die and so this is yeah, an open question about okay well what may be both new crops that we could cultivate like chickpeas we see people growing many different things that uh, we wouldn't necessarily grow in germany um, in the past um, but also different um, plant flowering plants that are from australia or from warmer climates that are now thriving or doing well in the gardens and so part of our next step is to develop these plant lists those that are native, those that are non-native that gardeners can select that, yeah, could be good for, or that are proposed to be good for pollinators, um, particularly wild bees, and have that also be like a point of like open discussion. So our next step is very participatory with the gardeners where we're developing these interventions, these like insect friendly interventions that we will together implement with the gardeners. And some of those are specifically around plants, like creating a um, wildflower strip in the garden um, or having like herb spirals that have both native and non-native plants, cultivated and, and wild plants. Um, and seeing if those do booth have boosts for biodiversity or insect biodiversity in the gardens. Um, and seeing whether or not gardeners accept non-native plants uh, is also an open question. Um, so many people are, yeah, very, uh, or those that are more nature focused or do this like nature, 
garden, like yeah, biodiversity friendly gardening, uh, are very focused on whether the plants are native or not. Um, so whether or not they would accept uh, non-native plants is something that we will like have as a point of discussion in developing these interventions. Yeah. <laughs> so again, an open question. Yeah. Okay, we have uh, three questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is, um, no, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, one is very quick, maybe it's, um, oh. okay. How do you judge the potential of urban farming or gardening to make a significant contribution to food security? Uh, and then the next one is uh, from Kevin Vega, great talk, Monica. I'm with you on the ecological trap thing, something that people often ask about my wildflower work. But clearly, wind arthropods and wildflowers can disperse surprisingly far. Do you have any interest in expanding out to other organisms to help answer these questions? And if so, which? Um, do you want to? We're having getting more and more questions, but yeah, I think we, can, <laughs> we won't have time. Okay, uh, to the first question, the potential of urban farming to contribute to food security, right? Okay, yeah, um, I think, yeah, this is, there was a recent study that was just published um, from folks in Berlin saying that if Berlin, yeah, transformed X amount, I don't remember, like X amount of land into um, agricultural production that it could feed 80% of this, like the city's vegetable needs um, or f yeah, fresh fruit, fresh food needs. So that's one example um, where there's, yeah, there's certainly potential for, of urban agriculture to support food security in the city. I think that this is an, also recently due to the pandemic where some of our, where we had massive disruptions to our um, very industrial food system. Um, that where, yeah, some market shelves were were empty or certain products weren't on our shelves anymore. And I think this then was an open question or became a question of, okay, uh, can our own cities feed um, our residents? And so cities like Singapore are coming up with um, very ambitious ways to uh, promote I guess, self um yeah, self-sufficiency uh, in meeting the demands of city residents for food. Um, and so I certainly think that urban agriculture can make a very significant, like the Berlin study shows, if can make a significant a contribution to food security if we make land available to urban farm. And um, there's so many ecosystem services, uh, provisioning is one of them, uh, food provision or fiber provision, uh, et cetera, that we demand from urban ecosystems. And so I think, yeah, there's certain then also trade-offs that we have to make um, if we, yeah, devote more land uh, to urban farming. Um, so I would say certainly the, the, that urban agriculture can play um, an important role for urban food security. We already have millions of urban farmers across the world. Uh, and one, it's tricky to quantify uh, that contribution already of gardening and farming um, to urban food security. Many people say 15% or something already, but this is also a question of where you call urban and peri-urban and rural. <laughs> so this is also like a question of um, uh, terms. Uh, in define or in quantifying the contribution of urban agriculture to food security, the question is then yeah the land question or the space question, uh, in my perspective or one of the questions. And to Kevin's question, <laughs> uh, what species uh, could be interesting to ask? I think that yeah Kevin has a really interesting study system in looking at um, seed dispersal um, by by plants. Um, I haven't necessarily thought about what other organisms could be cool, but I think that looking at different uh, organisms across the trophic train or in, in food webs would be um, fascinating to also think about. Um, so I don't know, I, ha I also have to look into the literature of whether people are doing things on, on other dispersing organisms like birds <laughs> uh, or, or um, looking at, yeah, or other arthropod groups. Um, 
So yeah, I don't know, uh, but I'm happy to brainstorm with you, Kevin, um, to think about a cool study with, with diverse organism, organismic groups. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I really don't. So thank you very much, everyone, for the questions, also for the people online. Uh, I think we have to stop it here. It was a very interesting seminar. I think we will learn a lot and we can reflect when we go back home into our cities. So thank you very much, Monica, once again for, for your talk. Monica will be here for lunch if you want to ask her questions or you still have some doubts about urban ecology. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, lunch is waiting for us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for coming and for hosting. Yeah.